Hi guys, welcome to this revision summary video looking at topic 6, which is groups in the periodic table. Mainly focusing on group 1, the alkali metals, group 7, the halogens, and group 0, the noble gases. The aim for this video is to look at all the key things that you need to revise to get yourself ready for the exam. If you want to go into more detail on any particular part, I've put a link in the top right hand corner to the playlist which goes into each section of the video in more detail, including practice questions and the model answers for them. So this is just an overview, if you want more detail, have a look at the playlist in the top right hand corner. Part 1 then. What are the groups in the periodic table? So the first thing you need to know is the groups are the columns going down, as you can see here. There are three in particular that you need to know for your exam. Group 1, Group 7 and Group 0. Group 1, they are the alkali metals. Group 7, the halogens. And Group 0, the noble gases. The second section of this video is going to have a look at the alkali metals. Now hopefully you'll remember from the key concepts area that everything in Group 1 has one electron in the outer shell. That means they have the same chemical properties, they react the same way. The physical properties are that they are soft and they have low melting points. Now what you need to be able to do is tell me what happens when you take the alkali metals and you put them into water. The three that you need to remember are lithium, sodium and potassium. And if you pour all three into water, they float on water, they move about on water, and they fizz, proving you have a gas present. All three do that. The difference between lithium and sodium, however, is sodium moves slightly faster. It melts, so it turns into a molten ball. That proves that it's got a low melting point. And it gives off more gas, so you see more fizzing. When we move down to potassium, which is the next one down in the group, it moves even faster than sodium. It sets on fire with a lilac flame. And it gives off more gas, so you see more fizzing. Now, from that, you can work out the order of reactivity. So lithium is the least reactive, because it only floated, moved and fizzed. Sodium is the second most reactive, because it moved faster, gave off more gas, and formed a molten ball. And potassium is the most reactive, because it set on fire. So there are two ways they'll be asking you to describe these reactions. Number one, what happens when you put them into water, that's what we've just covered. And number two, word equations. So if we take lithium for example, if you put lithium into water, which has got the symbol Li and H2O, you get a hydroxide. So because the metal was lithium, we have lithium hydroxide, which has the formula LiOH. And I always get hydrogen gas when I put a metal into water, which is H2, remember it's diatomic. Now that word and symbol equation is exactly the same regardless of the metal from group 1. So if I had sodium instead of lithium, it would be sodium Na plus water H2O goes to sodium hydroxide NaOH plus hydrogen. And it's the same for potassium and everything else in group 1. And some of you will have pointed out this is not balanced, so what you have to do is look at the number of letters, the number of symbols on either side and make sure it's even, which would end up with two in front of your NaOH, two in front of your Na and two in front of your H2O. The third section of this video is going to have a look at the halogens. Again, they're in group 7, so they have 7 electrons in the outer shell. Again, they have the same chemical reactions, so they react the same way. The physical properties you need to remember for chlorine, bromine and iodine is that chlorine is a green gas, bromine is a brown liquid, and iodine is a black solid. Now, hopefully you can see from that the trend changes as you go down the group. So we've gone from a gas to a solid, therefore the melting points get higher as you go down the group. So astatine is still going to be a solid and fluorine is going to be a gas. Now there are a couple of things you need to be able to do with group 7. The first one of those is talk about the reactions between a metal and a halide. A halide is anything from group 7. So if I take a metal and chlorine, I'm going to get a metal chloride. The ending changes from INE to IDE. So for example, if I were to take sodium and react it with chlorine, I'd end up with sodium chloride. If I were to do the balanced equation for that, I have Na plus Cl2. Remember, everything in group 7 is diatomic, forms NaCl. Then put a 2 in front of my NaCl and Na, and it's balanced. 
This is the same for any metal. So if I have lithium and chlorine, it would make lithium chloride. Sodium and bromine, it would make sodium bromide. The trend continues regardless of what metal and what halide you have. But it's also the same if you have hydrogen instead of a metal. So hydrogen reacts with your halide, so hydrogen plus chlorine, and it makes hydrogen chloride, HCl. Again, balance it by putting a 2 in front of my HCl. And it doesn't matter the halide that you have, so hydrogen plus bromine, Br2, would make hydrogen bromide, and so on. The fourth section of this video is going to have a look at the displacement reactions of the halogens. Hopefully you can remember displacement reactions from paper one, where the more reactive halogen is going to swap places with the less reactive halogen to be part of the compound. So I've got a table in the bottom right hand corner, where I've got chlorine water, which is colourless, bromine water, which is orange, and iodine water, which is brown, and I'm going to react them with potassium chloride, potassium bromide, and potassium iodide, which are all colourless. Now the simple clue, if you see a colour change, it's reacted, therefore it's going to be more reactive. So I'm going to start off with chlorine reacting with potassium bromide. It goes from a colourless solution to an orange solution. That means bromine has been kicked out and chlorine is now part of the compound. So my word equation would look like chlorine plus potassium bromide goes to bromine plus potassium chloride. And if I do the symbol equation, chlorine is diatomic, so Cl2 plus potassium bromide is KBr, goes to bromine, Br2, and potassium chloride, KCl. This proves that chlorine is more reactive than bromine because I've seen a colour change, therefore it has reacted with it. So I can put chlorine is more reactive than bromine. If I do the same with chlorine reacting with potassium iodide, the same thing happens, I see a colour change. It goes from colourless this time to brown. So I know that chlorine is more reactive than bromine and iodine, and my word equation would be chlorine plus potassium iodide goes to iodine plus potassium chloride. So what happens if I add bromine water into potassium chloride and potassium iodide? If I take bromine water, which is orange, and add it into my colourless potassium chloride, the potassium chloride will stay colourless. This proves that bromine is less reactive than chlorine, which backs up what we said. But if I take bromine and add it into potassium iodide, it goes from colourless to brown. So again, I see a colour change, so my word equation is going to be bromine plus potassium iodide goes to iodine plus potassium bromide. Therefore, bromine is more reactive than iodine, and I can check that by adding iodine into both potassium chloride and potassium bromide. There is no colour change. If there's no colour change, it means it is less reactive than both of them. So, it becomes less reactive as you go down group 7. The only other thing you need to know about group 7 is the test for chlorine. Nice and simply, if you take chlorine, you put it into damp blue litmus paper, that blue litmus paper will turn red and then will bleach. The fifth part of this video is going to have a look at the noble gases. Now, the key thing about the noble gases is they have full outer shells. If they have full outer shells, it means they don't need to gain or lose electrons, which makes them inert or unreactive. So again, they have the same chemical properties. And they have very similar physical properties in that they're all colourless gases. But one thing that's really important to notice is that the density increases as you go down the group. These properties make them useful for three things. Balloons, welding, and filament bulbs. So what you're expected to know is the names of the noble gases that are used for each of those different uses, and an explanation as to why. And that's all to do with not needing to gain or lose any electrons. So if we have a look at party balloons or hot air balloons, they use helium. The reason for that is they are less dense than air. The other thing is they are unreactive, and also that makes them non-flammable. Hydrogen used to be used, hydrogen is highly flammable, so we don't use that. Why are they unreactive? They have a full outer shell, they don't want to gain or lose any electrons. If we have a look at welding, that's argon. The reason argon is used in welding is because it's inert, it provides an inert atmosphere. It means the oxygen doesn't react with the actual metal, causing impurities. And again, why? Because it's got a full outer shell, doesn't need to gain or lose any electrons. 
And then finally, filament light bulbs. You could use argon or krypton. Again, the reason, it's an inert atmosphere. The actual noble gases won't react with the hot filament. They won't corrode it, they won't break it. And krypton is used in bright lights as well, like flash photography, for exactly the same reason. Okay, final part of the video. How can we explain why group one increases in reactivity as you go down the group, but group seven decreases? And we're gonna start off looking at the outer shells. If you remember, group one has one electron in the outer shell and group seven has seven electrons in the outer shell, which means that group one metals want to lose electrons and group seven want to gain them. That's massively important. Now, as we go down the groups, the atomic radius increases, so the size of the atom. That means there are more shells with more electrons. So you get something called electron shielding. So as you go down the group, there is more electron shielding. Now you should remember the nucleus is positive and there's a force of attraction between our positive nucleus and our negative electron. But as the outer electron gets further away, that force of attraction becomes weaker. So that explanation is exactly the same for group one and group seven. The difference is group one wants to lose one and group seven wants to gain one. So for group one, it's easier to lose that electron because the force of attraction is weaker. Therefore, it's more reactive as you go down the group. But with group seven, it's harder to gain that electron because the force of attraction is weaker. So the explanation is the same, except for this one wants to gain it, which means it's less reactive. And that really is all there is to it for this topic. Short but sweet, but just make sure you know every little bit of it. Watch the video again if you're not sure. Make sure you're prepared and good luck in your exam. Hi guys, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please click on like down below. You can also subscribe to my channel, you can check out the latest video, and you can visit my website up above here. Bye now.